You might not know this, but making video games is hard. There are a million things that have to be done during development, and even more things that can go wrong. Usually, small indie titles still have a handful of people working on them, with a decent portion of games being made by teams with dozens of people, and some games even having numbers ranging into the hundreds or possibly thousands. But, for a variety of reasons, some people are actually crazy enough to take on the gargantuan task of creating a video game all by themselves. Now, back when games were small, it wasn't unheard of to hear about a guy creating a game on the computer in his garage. But, due to a variety of changes in the industry, this has become much more difficult. Still, many people do it, and sometimes these games actually turn out amazing and even revolutionize gaming as we know it. And I took the time to put together a list of 13 games made by one person. Now, I feel like I need to lay down some ground rules before we begin. I don't disqualify a game if someone helped them with the graphics or sound, because that would pretty much disqualify most of these, and this list wouldn't be very fun. But don't worry, most of the games in this list still had the lion's share done by one person. Also, I'm really sorry if I miss a game that you feel should be on this list. I've already spent over 100 hours on this video, and I feel pretty strong about the list I've accumulated, at least in terms of the popularity and impact each of these games has had. And I'm not including either Minecraft or Tetris on this list. Yes, Alexei Pajitnov did create and code the original Tetris by himself, but I'd argue that what we think of today as Tetris, and even on the Game Boy, was touched up by multiple hands first. And yes, technically Marcus Person, also known as Notch, did create Minecraft by himself. However, he started hiring more people to help him around 2011, so if I did want to include it, I'd have to review a very old version of Minecraft, and I just really don't want to do that. Also, Notch is maybe not a good person, so there's that. The format of this video going forward is that I'll say the game's rank, describe a little bit about the story behind the creation of that game, and then give my personal review for it. But before we get to that, let's make a quick deal. If while watching this video you learn three facts that you did not know about these video games before watching it, then you subscribe to my channel. But with that out of the way, please enjoy. Number 13. Getting Over It with Bennett Foddy Bennett Foddy is pretty well known in the game development industry. Hailing from Australia, Foddy at first pursued a career in philosophy with a focus in human addictions but he always dabbled with game development on the side. Eventually, he hit massive success with the Flash game Quop, which, while not everybody remembers by name, just about everyone has a verbal reaction to once they see a picture of the game. Eventually, Foddy went on to teach game design courses at NYU, and Humble Bundle commissioned him to make a game for PC. He decided he would make something small, and that, quote, the next game I make will be a popular one. But lo and behold, the streamability of this game put a lot of attention on it. And according to Foddy, it has been played by more than 2.7 million people. So, clearly this means the game will be fun and enjoyable, right? Well, no. Similar to other games made by Foddy, this game is designed to be frustrating by nature. Armed with only a Yosemite hammer, your goal is to get this man in a pot to the top of a mountain. All the while, Bennett Foddy himself provides some dialogue to encourage you. But unlike most games that normally want to see the player progressing forward, getting over it can be absolutely punishing, because with just one small mistake, the player can accidentally send themselves back to the start, losing hours of actual progress. And to add insult to injury, Foddy will often come in and comment on that. No, no. You cannot now believe that you will ever feel better. But this is not true. You're sure to be happy again. And knowing this, truly believing it, will make you less miserable now. Abraham Lincoln. Foddy mentions in the game that getting over it is actually an homage to an old B game called Sexy Hiking, and it's hard not to notice the similarity. At the end of the day, this game is what it is. It's frustrating and streamable as hell because of it. But I think most people would rather watch someone play it than actually play it themselves. Number 12, Five Nights at Freddy's. Scott Cawthon, the creator of the Five Nights at Freddy's series, or FNAF as it shall be called moving forward, has had a very interesting career path to say the least. Having previously worked for Hope Animation, a company dedicated to creating children's videos with Christian themes, to this. Funnily enough, he took what he learned from animating these Christian values videos and started making games, which he submitted to Steam Greenlight, an older application process to get games onto Steam's digital distribution service. 
Most of his games were rejected. A common theme amongst the criticism was that his characters looked like animatronics. In one of the most wild turns, Cawthon took this feedback and started making the first Five Nights at Freddy's game. After submitting it to sites like IndieDB, it was quickly brought to Steam, where it went on sale for $4.99. The game quickly gained huge popularity due to several prominent streamers playing the game. Don't you bitch! <laughs> and in just a few months, he published a sequel as well. One of the most impressive things about the FNAF series is how quickly Cawthon has been able to iterate and release new games, constantly keeping it in the public's eye. He has stated that before the series was released in 2004, he was actually working as a cashier in a Dollar General, and that three of his managers were in high school. And now, according to WealthyPersons.com, Cawthon's net worth is somewhere around $70 million. So, how are the FNAF games? I won't lie, I have only played the first game of the series and not all the way through. This is probably because I am a baby ass baby boy, and I don't personally enjoy the jump scares that are featured heavily in the games. I will say though, I have absolutely been amazed at the value of the intellectual property. FNAF merchandise is crazy popular, and I think a ton of people are at least aware of who some of the characters are, despite this being a pretty dark franchise. This is probably the most impressive thing about Five Nights at Freddy's. Scott Cawthon created this franchise all on his own, and once he knew he had lightning in a bottle, he ran with it, releasing six mainline games, five spin-off games, and even three books in a period of just five years. Also, I think he deserves a lot of credit for injecting an interesting narrative on top of the games, which has led to much speculation amongst fans. And while this franchise isn't personally my cup of tea, I could easily see someone ranking FNAF higher on the list. Number 11. Thomas Was Alone Mike Bithell was a British games designer working for Blitz Games in 2010. If you're not familiar with Blitz Games, they made many wonderful titles such as Bratz, Rock Angels, iCarly, and Sneak King. Yeah. So, Bithel joined a 24-hour game jam and started on what would become Thomas Was Alone. Originally, it was just a Flash game that Bithel created partly inspired by Oh Brother Where Art Thou and how the characters were chained together, trying to escape. He uploaded the game to Congregate.com where it got over 100,000 plays in one week. Going off this, Bithel decided to grow the game and teach himself how to code Unity at the same time. Overall, it took him about a year and a half. During this period, he became the lead game designer at Bossa Studios, who went on to publish the mobile port of Thomas Was Alone. Ultimately, the game sold over a million copies. So, how is it? Thomas Was Alone is a pretty simple side-scrolling platformer. The characters even remained rectangles from the original Flash version of the game. What makes it so charming is the voice acting of Danny Wallace, who narrates the game. What if there was some kind of inverted fall? Some way to... What's the word? Jump. Wallace's performance won him a BAFTA in 2013. The simple platforming and puzzle solving gameplay combined with the heartwarming voiceover adds a ton of character to the literal shapes that make up the game's cast. Destructoid's review at the time said, quote, Thomas Was Alone tells a story more complex than games orders of magnitudes more expensive and difficult to develop. Honestly, I feel a little bad scoring this game so low on the list, but at the end of the day, it is a very simple platformer, and the rest of the games on this list are a little bit more impressive. Number 10. Cave Story Even though this game was made after Roller Coaster Tycoon, another game that will appear on this list, I'd argue that Cave Story was the first big herald for the modern games made by one person movement. Created by Daisuke Amaya, also known as Pixel, who worked on the game over the course of five years starting on it when he was in college, and eventually finishing it on his free time after he got a job as a software developer. He released it for free online for PC in 2004, and it slowly gained popularity and acclaim over time. People were shocked at how polished a free game released by one man truly was. Pixel has said that he started by making the game's title screen and music, and then moving on to the rest. The game evolved to have a cave setting after he realized that a lot of the environments he created were all enclosed spaces. He also went on to say that the game took him so long because he didn't plan anything out from the start, and didn't have any dedicated map editing or data management tools. This game kicks off the Metroidvania Power Hour for this video. Cave Story will always have a soft spot in my heart, since I experienced it sometime in the mid-2000s after hearing about it online. I will 100% say, as a kid and even as an adult, 
This game can be hard as hell, especially the hidden area you have to find to get the good ending. Speaking of, there are tons of endings and branching paths in the story. And while part of me thinks you should experience this game blind for your first playthrough, you're going to hit some of the worst endings. Because some of the things you have to do to get the better endings are not naturally intuitive. But the gameplay is solid, the character designs are memorable, and the music slaps. Just as people reacted to this game back when it was first released, I still can't believe today that one man created everything this game has to offer. Number 9. Axiom Verge In a somewhat similar story to the creation of Cave Story, Axiom Verge was made by one man in his spare time. The game's sole creator Tom Happ worked for Petroglyph Games when he started work on Axiom Verge, and had previously worked on titles like End of Nations, NFL Street, and the Tiger Woods PGA Tour series. He started tinkering away on the game back in 2010 as a side project. The progress was slow, and for the first three years, it remained only that, a side project, until it was eventually funded by Sony, with the promise of an exclusivity window. This allowed Hap to quit his day job and commit more time to Axiom Verge, and from there, he was able to finish the rest of the game much faster. The heartbreak behind the story is that while creating the game, his wife gave birth to their first child, Alistair. The doctor thought the child was healthy, but he actually had jaundice. Left undiagnosed, this caused a rare form of brain damage, called Kernicterus, which has left Alistair mostly deaf and with severe damage to his motor skills. Since the release and success of Axiom Verge, Tom Happ has traveled the world with his wife in search of new cures for their son's condition. And if you feel inclined, I'll leave a link in the description below for a hospital researching cures for Kernicterus that Happ himself has requested people help fund. Of the few games I hadn't played before starting this video, this was probably the one I was most excited to play. I am a huge fan of retro style games and metroidvanias, and I'm not gonna lie, I was fairly disappointed. Granted, this was probably due to the way I played this game, trying to run through it as fast as possible so I could talk about it for this video. So you'll have to forgive me if I come off as really negative. Ultimately, I did like the game, but I have some grievances to air. Axiom Verge does do some really cool things, legitimately making glitches a gameplay mechanic, but one that isn't too heavily needed unless you're trying to find 100% of the items. And let's be clear, there is a lot of backtracking if you wanted to get everything. Before the final boss, I wanted to go back and make a clean sweep myself. But eventually, after two hours while I was using a guide, I said screw it, I want to fight the final boss now, and I still crushed him. There are a ton of extra weapons in the game, but I found myself using the same few over and over. Also, the story. While playing it, the game seemed a little oddly paced. There are some cool things done with making the player question who to trust, but in the end, the player still has to kill the original bad guy, and then it's over. Even after reading all the secret notes you can find in the game, I was still slightly confused. And the fandom itself is divided on what the game's true story is. There are some cool ideas here, and ultimately, the game is open for a sequel, which was announced last year. Again, I don't want to make it sound like I didn't like this game. I did, and I even put it above Cave Story overall. Mostly because that game has an insane difficulty spike at the end. But hey, there you go. Number 8. Iconoclasts The original concept of what would become Iconoclasts was started in 2007 by Joachim Sandberg. He didn't start serious production of the game until 2010, but it would still take him nearly eight more years to complete. This was caused by various reasons. Sometimes he would lose interest in the project, sometimes he would need to take another animation job to help pay the bills. Joachim says himself he's not sure if making a game alone is even a good idea, but that quote, I don't know if it's selfishness, stubbornness, or being afraid of having my own ideas shot down, but I haven't had too much of a desire to try working with others. If you didn't hear much about Iconoclasts, that might be because it released the same week as Celeste did. I picked it up about a month after release myself, and I've had some time to ruminate on it. So, how does Iconoclasts stand up? First off, wow, this game is absolutely gorgeous. This is probably my favorite looking game on the entire list. The sprite work is simply incredible. But despite the vibrant and colorful visuals, Iconoclasts' story is surprisingly dark. It's about a world ruled by a corrupt religion known as the One Concern that hoards over a power source known as Ivory, controlling the masses and even performing experiments on some to give them supernatural powers. The world building and characters are where this game really shines. And I have to give props to Sandberg for how masterfully he uses text boxes. The way they size up when characters are yelling and pop in front of each other when someone cuts someone off is perfect. Even without voice actors, I can still literally hear these characters' voices in my head. 
The gameplay is a pretty fun Metroidvania, with obvious influences from Cave Story, although sometimes the platforming can be a mixed bag. I think the game goes on for a little bit too long, and some of the pacing is spotty. Like I said, the main star here is the characters and the conflict, which was definitely the main factor in bringing me back to complete this game. Number 7. Roller Coaster Tycoon even in 1999, with the release of the first Roller Coaster Tycoon, business simulation games weren't an entirely new concept. In fact, Sid Meier had originated the Tycoon title almost a decade before, with Sid Meier's Railroad Tycoon back in 1990. And for the creator of Roller Coaster Tycoon, Chris Sawyer, this wasn't even his first rodeo, having made Transport Tycoon back in 1994. This game, which was also a solo project by Sawyer, was critically praised, taking the complexity of other business sims and combining them with the excellent UI of SimCity. After this, he decided to take time off and figure out what he wanted to do next. He used the sales of Transport Tycoon to travel Europe, often visiting theme parks. It was then and there that the idea for Roller Coaster Tycoon was born. Funnily enough, Sawyer says that before this, he actually hated roller coasters, but once he caught the bug, he started traveling around the world, consulting with theme park owners for research, and investing all his findings into the first Roller Coaster Tycoon game. It sold incredibly well, with most accounts saying it broke 1 million copies in the first year alone. A truly incredible number, especially for the time. Sawyer went on to make the second game, updating the graphics slightly and adding iconic features, such as the ability to construct your own roller coasters. Honestly, I think you could mention this game to just about anybody, even non-gamers, and they would recall having played this game. And that is in part due to Chris Sawyer's absolute brilliance as a coder. If you think about it, Roller Coaster Tycoon was able to run at a stable frame rate on just about any computer, which in the 1990s is really saying something. It's complicated to explain, but Sawyer coded the entire game by hand in assembly, which if you know anything about coding yourself, you're probably cringing. Long story short, this means he put in an absolutely insane amount of work. But in the end, he had a theme park game that could simulate all of the rides and even a thousand or so people at the same time. And all of this ran smoothly on a computer that had the processing power of a Curie coffee machine today. This was probably the hardest game to place on this list. If Sawyer had only made the first game by himself, I would have put it lower, but you cannot deny the incredible reach and impact of Roller Coaster Tycoon 2. After this, Sawyer took a step back from the industry, but maintained the rights of the franchise. So even though the new games haven't been received as well, he's had a pretty steady income nonetheless. Number 6. Braid while I said earlier that Cave Story was the first to popularize the idea of games being made by one person, I'd probably argue that Braid blew the whole thing wide open. And of all the games on this list, it probably has the biggest impact on the gaming industry. Started by indie game superstar Jonathan Blow in 2004, and released on August 6th, 2008, on the Xbox 360's Emergent Xbox Live Arcade, Braid took the world by storm, being downloaded by over 55,000 people in its first week alone, and ultimately landing in an eight-way tie for the fifth best game for the Xbox 360, according to Metacritic. Jonathan Blow recalls that he sank over $200,000 of his own money into the game's development, landing himself in serious debt, until one day he checked his laptop and saw, quote, there were a lot of zeros in my bank account. Jonathan Blow is a somewhat controversial figure in games, his critics often cast him as a pretentious blowhard, but there's no denying that he genuinely cares about games and wants to elevate the medium. Braid was originally conceived in 2004, while Blow was on a trip to Thailand. He put together some rudimentary level designs and was encouraged by some friends to keep working on it. He ended up designing all of the levels that were in the final version of the game in the next nine months. And despite this version of the game not having the artwork found in the final version, it won the award for best game design at the 2006 Independent Games Festival. Blow spent the next couple of years working with David Hellman to create more appealing art design for the game, while personally polishing the gameplay. His final goal with Braid was to expand the player's mind, and while he didn't use any completely original gameplay mechanics, he didn't want it to feel like any other game that came before. So, did he succeed? Largely, yes. I was only 17 when this game was released on the Xbox Live Arcade, and the big marketing push that Microsoft put behind the game brought it to my attention. I was astounded by the game's art design, and just like Blow had wanted, it truly didn't feel like any game I had played before. At first glance, it's only a side-scrolling puzzle platformer with time control mechanics thrown in. But before every world, there is a collection of paragraphs for the player to read. At the time, this felt very profound to me, and in going back and playing this, I was actually struck by some of the statements. And of course, one can't talk about this game without mentioning the ending. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen the ending of Braid. The whole game features the main character Tim trying to rescue a princess from a monster, 
and the final level features you and the princess working in tandem to escape the clutches of an evil man. But once you finally reach the princess, time is played in reverse, and it's revealed that the princess was actually trying to escape Tim the entire time. Back in 2008, there simply weren't games that did this, or at least none that it made a dent on the mainstream. Jonathan Blow had made his impact on the gaming industry, and immediately poured the fortune he made from Braid into making his follow-up, The Witness. And while that game wasn't made entirely by Blow himself, it was received well by critics. Number 5. Dust and Elysian Tale It's truly hard to believe, but apart from the voice acting, soundtrack, and parts of the story, this entire game was made by a self-taught artist named Dean Dodrill. Originally, Dodrill wanted to create an animated movie, but decided the story he wanted to tell was better suited to a video game. He initially anticipated it would take him about three months to learn how to code and release a small 8-bit style game. And he quickly found out how much more complicated game development really was. But the slow learning also led him to infuse his own artwork into the project. Six months after he started full development for the game, he had a small pitch for Xbox Live Arcade, and they offered to produce the game. And Dodro went into crazy production, literally working 20-hour days. He credits his family for helping him get through it, sometimes literally putting food in between him and his monitor and forcing him to eat. After roughly three and a half years of this, Dust in Elysium Tale was finally complete. I gotta say, after replaying a lot of these games where the player is made to feel weak, it felt awesome to play an empowering, combo-based hack and slash game. The combat is really fun, and I simply cannot believe it was made by one man, who prior to this didn't have a clue about game development. Sure, the story is somewhat generic, but the animations are fantastic, particularly on the main character, Dust, which Dodrill drew by hand. Playing this game in 120 frames per second was simply gorgeous. My main complaints come with some of the trope-heavy story and some of the mechanics not always meshing perfectly. But considering this is one of the oldest games on this list that I missed out playing when it was initially released, I was very impressed with how this game held up, and I would recommend it to just about anyone. Number 4. Papers, Please the creator of Papers, Please, Lucas Pope, probably had the biggest AAA games job out of anybody mentioned so far in this video. Before setting out to make his own game, he was actually working for Naughty Dog, having helped create the graphical user interface on Uncharted 1 and 2 before he decided to move to Japan with his wife to be closer to her family. While here, he traveled a lot around Asia and back and forth between the US. While doing so, he had a spark of inspiration while watching customs officers checking passports. Quote, they have a specific thing they're doing, and they're just doing it over and over again. He took this idea, combined with movies such as Argo and the Bourne Trilogy, which featured characters sneaking in and out of foreign countries, but turned it on its head, having the player be the customs officer checking people's paperwork before allowing them to enter. Pope submitted the game to Steam Greenlight in April 2003, expecting it to slowly gather interest as he showed it at upcoming gaming expositions. But thanks to several prominent YouTubers playing it, the game ended up being passed onto Steam in just a matter of days. Pope spent the next few months polishing the game before its first official release in August of that year. And as of 2016, Pope has confirmed that nearly 2 million copies have been sold. So how is it? I adore this game. I think I started playing it shortly after its release and it consumed me. Pope's background in user interface is perfectly used in the creation of this game. It's somewhat clunky by design. Your job is to process as many people as possible, either accepting them into the fictional country of Arstotska or rejecting them. The game starts out easy, but ramps up in difficulty perfectly, so that towards the end of the game, you become so good at finding the exact mistake in the huge amount of paperwork you've been given. Also, the story is surprisingly fantastic. There are several different endings available to you depending on who you help or don't help. And also, this freaking guy. If you haven't played this game, I seriously urge you to do so. Pope has said that he's happy about the success the game has received, saying that it's made him financially stable, but also worried about the pressure he felt to create another great game afterwards. But judging by the critical acclaim his next game, Return of the Obra Dinn, has received, I'd say he's doing just fine. Hey, uh, just a really quick update here. I realized a little late into production that Return of the Obra Dinn was actually also made entirely by Lucas Pope. I'd assumed that he got a team to help him make this game, but nope, he uh, did it all by himself again. So that video game should be on this list. Unfortunately, it's just a little late into production here and I can't add it in right now. 
Um, if it makes you feel any better, I probably would have put it at number five. I think it's a fantastic game, really inventive, but personally, I enjoyed Papers, Please, and the rest of the games on this list just a little bit more. Um, but yeah, again, thank you. Sorry, uh, but please enjoy the rest of the video. Thank you. Number three, Spelunky. The game's creator, Derek Yu, has always been fascinated with game design. As a child, he remembers loving video games so much that when he wasn't playing them, he would sketch out levels for games that didn't even exist. One day, his mom bought him Click and Play, a somewhat rudimentary software set for making games. He started posting some of the games he made online in an old AOL forum, and immediately started getting feedback on these games, which he recalls as a formative moment for him, since he was still very young. Through these internet forums, he eventually met Andy Hall, who would end up being Spelunky's programmer. But after spending years working on the indie game Aquaria, which won the grand prize of the 2007 Independent Games Festival, he decided he wanted to take a step back. Yu had grown nostalgic for the time when he made games as a kid, with little to no pressure, often just creating for the sake of fun. And this is when he started on Spelunky. At the time, roguelike games weren't in the zeitgeist like they are today, and Spelunky can almost single-handedly be credited with the genre's rise in popularity. Yu had the idea to make a side-scrolling platformer roguelike because he was learning how to code by making other simple platformers. Eventually, he posted the first version online, in a similar internet forum as he did with his early games, and he got some serious attention. In fact, Jonathan Blow, the creator of Braid, personally contacted him to report some bugs, but also told him that he really liked Spelunky, and he would be happy to put him in touch with his publisher. Derek Yu, obviously a little starstruck, couldn't believe it. While design was his strong suit, he wasn't a great programmer, and he actually asked Jonathan Blow if he wanted to help program the game. Blow turned him down, however, because he was working on other projects at the time. But then, you remembered his old friend, Andy Hall. Together, they spent the next few years refining the game and giving it a new coat of paint. Eventually, they would release the game on Xbox Live Arcade in 2012. So, how is Spelunky? Well, if you made it to this far in the video, you either know how amazing this game is, or you're yelling at me for not making it number one. People love this game. And I'll admit, before setting out to make this video, it was a huge blind spot on my gaming list. And I'm Mr. Roguelike. I've easily put over 1,000 hours into The Binding of Isaac, and tons more into Enter the Gungeon, which is my personal favorite in the genre. But Spelunky is fantastic. At first, I was a little turned off by the platforming gameplay, which isn't normally my bag, but I quickly fell into the classic roguelike loop of just one more run, until many hours flew by. And just like any other incredible roguelike, there is an insane amount of death to Spelunky. Like I said, if I had played this game earlier, and if I liked platformers more, it might rank higher on my list. But I still have an immense amount of respect for how incredibly good this game actually is, and the undeniable legacy that it has. And personally, I cannot wait for Spelunky 2. Number 2, Undertale. The game's creator Toby Fox got his start primarily as a musician. He composed music for the webcomic Homestuck and designed some ROM hacks for the game Earthbound. But in 2013, as a junior in college, he started experimenting with Game Maker Studio, wanting to create an RPG with a battle system completely different from the normal design specifically to, quote, utilize the medium as a storytelling device, instead of having the story and gameplay abstractions be completely separate. He reached out to artist Temi Chang, whom he had never spoken with before, and asked her if she would like to create a game with him. In just a few months, they had thrown some things together and launched a Kickstarter campaign on June 5th, 2013, with a goal of $5,000. In just two months, he raised over 50,000. Overall, the game took Fox 32 months. And while the exact sales numbers are hard to come by, it's somewhere in the millions plural. So, how is the game? Despite sometimes being annoyed by this game's fandom, I have to admit, this game pushes a lot of the right buttons for me. The humor is fantastic, which is one of the things Fox says he really focused on when designing the game. And obviously, I have to mention the combat, which, in addition to a bullet hell style mode, allows the player to spare any monster they come across, which was a really fresh idea. And the way it constantly changes keeps things fresh for the whole six hour playthrough. And that's not even mentioning all of the different endings and reasons to replay the game with subsequent playthroughs that can be affected by your previous ones. Whole essays have been written on Undertale. The game is extremely clever, and the soundtrack that Toby Fox made for it is arguably one of the best soundtracks of the last decade. Megalovania, which Fox had actually composed before the game, became a pretty popular meme just by itself. Megalovania. 
and due to the game's popularity in Japan, the character Sans actually got a costume in Super Smash Bros., which is something I don't think anyone would have seen coming. At the end of the day, Toby Fox seemingly came from nowhere and released a game that made huge waves. And his follow-up, Delta Rune Chapter 1, which was released for free, has also been highly praised by his fans. If you're still here, you know the one game that I have yet to mention. Number 1. Stardew Valley Eric Barone had just graduated college in 2011 with a degree in computer programming, but he wasn't able to secure a job right away with the economy being what it was at the time. While he had always been a creative type, making small albums or drawings or even small games, he felt that he was awkward in interviews. At the time, he was living in his parents' house with his girlfriend, and he made a promise to himself and to her that he would spend the next six months to create and finish a video game. He thought that this would give him the coding experience, the confidence, and something to add to his portfolio by the time the next hiring season came around. Being a huge fan of the early Harvest Moon games, and feeling like the series had decreased in quality over the years, he wanted to make a simple game inspired by the earlier titles in the franchise. Well, surprise surprise, the game took five years to be released. The whole time, Barone was barely scraping by, mostly relying on help from his parents and his girlfriend, who supported him the whole way, even though he often went without a job. Barone would work on the game sometimes for 14 hours or more a day, just to hit deadlines. He revealed the game on Steam Greenlight back in 2012 to help gauge interest for it. It turns out a lot of people wanted a new Harvest Moonlight game. He easily could have released it in early access, and probably have started making money earlier, but he refused, wanting the game to be feature complete before he launched it. And while the game has received many sizable updates since its launch, you can't help but admire Barone for sticking to his guns. And while the years he labored on the game saw Barone nearly penniless, while writing this script, he announced the game had sold over 10 million copies, making him a multi-millionaire in the process. Of all the games I hadn't played before I started doing research for this video, I mostly dreaded playing this one. A real quick confession, I have never played a Harvest Moon game. And while I loved Animal Crossing on the GameCube, I haven't returned to the series since because I was worried about how much time I would sink into them. So, how did I come to rank this game at the top of my list? Well, very quickly once I started playing, this game put me at ease, and I felt very relaxed. It wasn't a time sink at all, but a chill time. Since I quit my job at the beginning of this year to start making these videos more full-time, I have put a ton of pressure on myself, and when I played this game, all of that pressure went away. Mimicking the player character's whole arc of escaping the grind of normal life and embracing the carefree nature of tending to their farm. And I've been consistently impressed by the depth of the game, constantly adding new things to be layered on top, all the while not forcing the player to do anything that they don't want to. Normally when I play games like this, I stress out trying to max out my production, but with the execution of this game, I wasn't stressed at all. This game kicks ass, and I have no doubt that I will keep returning to it long after I finish making this video. Hey, I just wanted to say thank you very, very much for watching this video. I had no idea how much of a monster it was going to be when I started doing the research for this. <sighs> if you enjoyed what you saw today, and I'm assuming you do because you're still watching this video, um, please consider subscribing to this channel. And if you wanted to see some more of the content we do here, please consider checking out our Twitch channel, where we do a weekly gaming news game show every week where you can actually interact with us and help determine who wins. And also, we have a Discord where you can talk with us as well. And, as I mentioned in the video, I actually quit my job last month so I could spend more time making long-form videos like this one. So, if you're in any way able to help me financially, we do have a Patreon as well, where we put up a new bonus episode every month. And we actually just released one of our bonus episodes for free, where we ranked all of the Nintendo consoles so people could get a better idea of what kinds of videos we put up on our Patreon. And I'm actually going to be at PAX East at the end of this month, so if you're there and you see me, say hey. Uh, and I think that pretty much covers everything, so thank you very much again for watching, and have a wonderful day.